Hey everyone, welcome to another Fall 2022 Chainlink Hackathon workshop. We'll just give it a couple minutes for some people to flow in and, and then we'll get started. Get some GMs in the chat and uh, tell me where tell me where you're streaming in from tonight or today or this morning. Oh, nice Nigeria, Iraq. India, Delhi, awesome. Three thirty one, that's pretty good total in Bulgaria. Hungary, nice. Canada, Mumbai, India, awesome. All right, we'll, get, we'll give it one more minute and then we'll get started. Just out of curiosity, if anyone has deployed or done any Solana development before, um, let us know in the chat. Texas, nice. Okay, I think we're just about ready. Basic anchor development, nice one. Okay, I'm going to share my screen. Solana stops sometimes their blockchain. Um, yeah, but I think I think it should be okay now. Um, you'll find out very soon in the next few minutes that Solana is very different to Ethereum or any other EVM type chains. Um, so they're they're trying to approach things differently um, and, and to try make a blockchain that that really scales for for billions of users. But anyway, let's get started. So welcome everyone to another Chainlink Fall 2022 Hackathon workshop on um, this time, Introduction to Solana and Anchor. So my name is Harry Papakarisiu and I'm a developer advocate manager at Chainlink Labs and I'm also a big fan of Solana and everything they're doing. So that's why I'm giving this talk today to, to everyone. So hopefully it's a very quick one hour blast through intro of what Solana is, but hopefully when you come out of it, you understand the main differences between Solana and say Ethereum or other EVM chains. And you also have some knowledge and experience in how to actually deploy um, a smart contract on Solana and interact with it, as well as how to use Chainlink price feeds on Solana. So first things first, Solana has sponsored a track or a prize in this hackathon here, which means you have the opportunity to win 10K uh, if you build the best project on Solana as part of this hackathon. And the good news is um, because Solana is a uh, program on Solana, it's definitely an emerging blockchain and an ecosystem. It's not as popular as Ethereum yet or EVM. Um, so if you enter in this track, you're going to have a better chance of winning a prize than um, if you enter in, in uh, an EVM track or the main track, because um, dare I say, more people are going to be entering with Solidity based projects. Um, but if you want a better chance of winning, highly recommend you trying to play around with Solana, having a look because you'll have a better chance of winning a, a prize here. 
So um, if, you, if you're interested in that, definitely recommend just giving it a shot. Um, if you know how to program in Rust, definitely recommend to give it a shot and take a look. Um, but yes, $10,000 for the best project built on Solana as part of this hackathon project. You need to use Chainlink as well because it's a Chainlink hackathon. Um, so we'll go through Chainlink data feeds later. Um, but just yeah, keep in the back of your head, um, if you enter a project um, built on Solana, you'll be eligible to um, potentially take home this prize here. Cool, so let's move on and start talking about an introduction to Solana. So Solana is an open source uh, public blockchain. Uh, the unit of account is a uh, sole token. Uh, it can be broken up into what are called LAM ports, right? So when you hear someone say LAM ports, it's a fraction of a sole. Um, and they're actually, despite what people think, they're actually um, quite decentralized now. They've got approximately 2,000 nodes. Uh, it's fast, it's cheap. And their Nakamoto consensus uh, number, the latest number, I think was 31 or somewhere in the 30s, which is pretty good. Uh, it's definitely up there with uh, in terms of decentralization. So um, it's one of the few chains where they've got a good level of decentralization now and they're able to um, be fast and cheap as well. So they've got a number of real enhancements that they use to basically become so fast to scale to so many users. So Solana ecosystem, um, the mainnet is called mainnet beta. So if you hear mainnet beta, it just means mainnet. Um, and in terms of where you do development, um, the environment that you're going to want to use is called DevNet. So it's kind of like their testnet um, specifically for developers. So when you're building smart contracts and testing them and things like that, you want to use the DevNet network. So um, other than that, uh, I'm not going to go into too much detail because as a, as a developer, you probably don't need to know as much of this. However, highly recommend you research it if you want to. Um, but they use a proof of stake consensus mechanism as well as this new innovation called proof of history uh, which they use to um, order transactions, basically. Let's move on. So the biggest and most important thing you need to know when you're building stuff on Solana is that um, there is a separation of uh, program or, or logic and state, right? So um, if you're coming from the Ethereum world, when you deploy a smart contract, in the smart contract, you have variables, you have arrays, you have all these things. And, and they're stored in that contract at the deployed address. But with Solana, um, you when you deploy code, it's just that, it's just code. There's no state that's associated with it. Um, you, don't, you don't put state in the code. State is stored in these other things that are called accounts, right? And an account is basically, it's a buffer, but you can think of it as like a file in an operating system. It's a file that includes a bunch of metadata that says, you know, what's all the stuff in this file? Who owns the file? Who has access to this file, et cetera? Um, so that's the biggest difference between Solana and Ethereum. With Solana, you deploy code, but it's just code. There's no state in it. There's no variables. There's no arrays. And that code takes in as inputs a bunch of accounts, which are basically like files. And then the code modifies the state of those accounts or files as part of the logic. And then after everything's finished, the, the, the accounts have been modified and the code has done it, but the actual state is stored in the files separate from the code. So that's the biggest thing you need to realize is the program accounts model. Instead of putting code together with state, um, in Solana it's separated. We have programs, which is just logic, and then programs take a bunch of accounts to then modify data in. So in an ERC-20 example, which is like your standard token contract in Ethereum. You have one contract that has all the state in it. It stores everything, including who has what balances. In Solana, you'd have a, a token contract um, that has all the code and the functions to withdraw and transfer and things, but those functions would take in accounts as inputs. So a transfer function would have a, a from and the to uh, account, and it would um, remove tokens from the from account and add them to the to account, right? And, and, and then it would end. So yeah, just wanted to reiterate the difference between Solana and Ethereum mainly is this separation of uh, logic and state on Solana. If you have any questions, feel free to ask in the chat and I'll try to get to them uh, at the end. So here's what uh, an account actually looks like if you actually look at it. Um, so it's basically just a bunch of metadata. So you've got um, data here, which is a byte stream. Uh, it's a byte array that has all the data. It's got LAN ports, which basically means, um, as you remember, that's the unit of account. So it says how much um, 
how much soul does this account have in it? And, and you'll learn why you need soul in accounts very soon. And then it's just some other metadata, like what is the public key of this account? Uh, is it writable? Who owns it? Is it executable, et cetera? So um, the basic operational unit on Solana is an instruction, right? So think of it as like a, a call to a program or a smart contract. And uh, an instruction is split into three different things. So you've got the program ID, uh, you've got the accounts that you want to modify, and then the instruction data, which is like your input parameters that you're passing in. And uh, a transaction is basically just a list of these instructions put together. Uh, and the way you interact with Solana is you bundle up these instructions um, and then you submit them via a JSON RPC API to a Solana node, right? So if you take a look on the right here, you can see there's two instructions. Um, the first one is an instruction to uh, the program ID listed there. And the instruction has two accounts, you know, or files as you can think of them um, that are passed in to that instruction. There is um, that byte array underneath there. And then under that, you've got another instruction which calls a the same program ID, I think, yep. Uh, but it's passing in different accounts and different um, instruction data. And those two are bundled together in a transaction that has, you know, execute instruction one and then instruction two. And then um, when that's submitted to the Solana node, uh, it will process those instructions. Are there resources or documentations available to learn more about Solana development? Yes, great question. At the end of this presentation, I will share a number of examples for you. So if you just hang around. Uh, yes, we went through that one just now, so I won't go through that again. So the instruction data that you pass in is kind of like a, um, it's kind of like your input parameters, right? So when you're using Solidity, you can just pass in a number or a string or whatever. But in Solana, when you're using raw Solana anyway, you can't do that. You have to pass in a, a byte array, right? Um, so if you want to pass in a number of like 100 as a, as a input parameter, um, if you're not using Anchor, which we're going to get to soon, you have to serialize that number 100 into a byte array and then pass it in, um, which is makes it a bit tricky. Um, but this is how Solana scales so well. It's the developers take on a little bit of pain so that the, so that the protocol itself can scale. Um, but we'll, we'll learn more about that soon. So, so yeah, you basically have your smart contracts that you write in Rust, C or C++. They get deployed to the Solana uh, network. And then to interact with those um, smart contracts, once they're deployed, you, you can write clients using, uh, you know, um, JavaScript, Rust, front ends, et cetera. And they interact with the Solana deployed programs via a JSON RPC API, essentially, which we'll go through some examples in a minute. So that's at a high level, how you uh, interact with Solana programs and how you kind of deploy them. Um, so let's talk about economics and rent now. Is there a number to a limit of instructions in the transactions? Uh, no, I don't. Not that I know of. No, you can bundle up as many as you want. I think. So you might remember I talked about accounts earlier and how they they basically store data. So with Solana, um, there's transaction fees like other chains as well. But there's also this notion of of rent, which means that if you want to store data in accounts you need to make sure those accounts have enough LAN ports in them to then go to be paid to the nodes that actually store the data, right? So it's kind of like paying rent for an apartment or a house. Um, and it, the amount you need to pay depends on how much data you're storing in the account. And, and there's certain, um, if you go to Solana docs, there's certain formulas and, and values that you can use to calculate. But essentially, there's two methods of paying uh, rent for, Solana, for storage on Solana. The first one is, a set and forget method where if you pay for two years worth of rent up front based on the amount that you've got in the account, the amount of data, um, you don't ever have to pay any more rent again. It will, it will um, never take more. Um, or if you don't want to pay for two years up front, you can just pay per byte. So they're the two methods that people use. A lot of people generally go with option one, set and forget. Now here's where it gets a little bit tricky um, but we're not going to go into this in huge amount of detail because we've only got one hour. So like I said earlier, um, Solana is very fast and, and the way it achieves speed or part of it is 
um, through making things a bit harder for developers so that it can scale better. And in the case of interacting with Solana programs and passing in um, input parameters and things like that, um, you saw it was done using byte arrays before um, or byte streams. And essentially what you need to do is um, for that, you need to serialize any uh, input parameters you want into your byte array and, and then that gets sent on chain and then you need to deserialize it back into its original form. So, so that's what we mean by serialization and deserialization. If you want to pass in the parameter 1,000 to a function call in Solana, you need to take that integer 1,000, you need to serialize it into a stream of bytes. That gets sent as the uh, instruction data to the function call and then on chain on the smart contract, you then take that byte stream and then uh, deserialize it back to an integer and, and then you have your integer of a thousand that you can then do stuff with. So that's what we mean by the concept of serialization and deserialization. Um, basically taking something, an object, uh, a string, whatever, turning it into a stream of bytes, submitting it via the JSON RPC API to the Solana program, and then deserializing it back into what it originally was. Um, luckily, um, I highly recommend you check this out if you're interested in it, but luckily, if you use the anchor framework, which we're going to go through right now, um, you don't have to do this. But just wanted to point out that this is what happens under the hood um, regardless. So how are we doing for time? 20 past almost. Okay. Let's move on to anchor now. So anchor is a framework for quickly building Solana programs, essentially. Um, and the way it does that is it generates all this boilerplate code for you so that you don't have to do a lot of the pain such as serialization and deserialization and things like that. So it's actually used by almost everyone in Solana because it's, it's really popular now. Um, and the way some of the tools in which it uses is uh, obviously you have your smart contracts that you write in Rust. It's got this thing called IDL or interface description language, which we'll go through. Uh, it's got, um, and you can generate clients using a, a JavaScript package and it's got its own CLI, which we'll go through as well. So the way the workflow in Anchor works is you know, you've got your smart contracts that are written in Rust. And, and from there, the smart contracts, you can build them. Um, it compiles a Rust program into bytecode, but it also generates this uh, interface description language file, right? And, and from that IDL file, uh, which we'll go through in a minute, you can then generate clients, client uh, code. And, and with the clients, you can then talk and interact with the smart contracts and test them. So... Um, Anchor, a program that uses the Anchor framework essentially consists of three parts. You've got the, the program module, which is where all the program logic is written. Um, you've got the account structs where all of the accounts that are passed into the program uh, are validated. And, and then you've got this thing at the top called a declare ID macro, which stores the address of the program that's currently being executed. Right, and we're gonna go through those in the hour. So here's just a small bit of Rust. Um, and you can see the, the parts in red are, actually, I'll just hide my head here so it's not in the way. Um, the parts in red are essentially these little hooks that you put in for anchor. So um, the declare ID bit at the top here, that basically says this is the ID of the program that's running. This is the public key address of the program. Um, the little program uh, hook there in red, it basically says over here is where all the logic for this anchor program is. Um, and then this, that derive accounts little hook at the bottom there says here are all the accounts that are expected to be passed in to this program um, and here's what you need to do with them. So they're kind of, this kind of shows how the three uh, little hooks that you put in in an anchor program are. So first we'll look at the accounts. So which is these, this derive account section here. So this is where you define which accounts your instruction expects and, and which constraints these accounts should follow. Right, so you're basically saying, I've got some code here that's gonna do stuff to some accounts that are passed in. And remember accounts are just like files. So the, the logic is just gonna modify the state of them. Um, and this is where we're saying, this is what you need to do with, with these accounts here. Great question in the chat. I don't have any idea of Rust programming language. How does it take to master this language in order to be effective in building projects in Solana? Excellent pro, uh, question there. Um, Akin Fenwa. Uh, I actually didn't know Rust until recently, so I, I took it upon myself to learn. 
uh, a little bit. You don't actually need to know a lot of Rust to learn Solana. You kind of just need to know the basics because it doesn't use a huge amount of Rust. The main thing you need to know is just how to deal with that separation of logic and state in Solana and how to work out what should be stored in which accounts and then how you should modify the accounts on Solana. That's probably the hardest part in my opinion. But if you if you just start reading the, I'll, I'll share some resources at the end, but if you just start learning Rust, um, you know, a couple of hours a day or an hour a day or a few hours a week, probably in less than a month, you, you'll you kind of know enough to be able to understand what most Solana programs are doing, I'd say. Uh, okay, let's move on. So in this uh, anchor example here, you can see that um, you've got this, uh, here's the program logic. Here's the declare ID that says, this is the program ID of this program. Um, this has a, a set data function here, right? And um, you'll notice in this set data function, it has this thing called context here. And the context is set to set data. Um, this is on purpose because this is basically saying um, for this function call here, I'm expecting the accounts that are passed in in the set data um, section in the accounts. So if you go down to the accounts section, you'll see this pubstruct set data. So this is kind of where it matches. And this is essentially saying when that when any function that uses this set data is called, it's expecting this my account account. And um, that's just what it's called. And the type of account that it is, is of type my account here. And if you scroll up a bit to the account derive my account, uh, account derive section here, you'll see pubstruct my account. And in there, it's just like a struct with a, a data uh, unsigned integer 64 bit. So essentially we're saying when this set function, set data function is called, we're expecting this one account to be passed in called my account. And it the type should be of my account, which is this struct. So that's kind of how we're linking the, the accounts with the, the functions. Um, and you can actually see it's actually taking in this thing called data as an input parameter, which is an unsigned integer 64 bit. So we, we don't have to do any serializing and deserializing. We can literally pass in, in the function call um, an integer, which is completely different to what we saw earlier with the serialization and deserialization. Um, so um, this is just a simple example of, of how, to use, how to use Anchor, how to specify you know, where your program logic should be, how you specify what the program ID is and the declare ID, and how you could specify what each function should expect in terms of the account info. Uh, let's see this question in the chat. In the given example, my account needs to be owned by the, the Hello Anchor program. Um, yes, yes. And part of the reason actually why we have this declare ID at the top is so that Anchor knows what the idea of this program is. So Anchor can basically verify ownership and things like that. Um, it's because, if, you know, you might think it's a bit weird to say, you know, in, in, in Ethereum, you can go address of this to, to get the current address of the deployed contract. But in Solana or in Anchor, you can't have to manually specify it here. Um, great question. So the Anchor program module is where the business logic is defined. Um, you write your functions, which can then be called by clients or other programs. Um, and like I said earlier, each defined endpoint takes a context type as an argument, which provides access to the accounts of the executing program. So as you saw earlier here, we have the context of set data, and then we take a, um, a data parameter as input. And um, then we can just you know, do whatever we want to uh, do with that data input parameter in, in the logic there, but everything is specified in this kind of program hook here. Is there a remix equivalent in Solana? Yes, we're gonna, you're gonna see it in probably a couple minutes, I think. So in terms of the instruction data, um, like I said earlier, uh, you, you can add it by adding arguments to the function that you're calling after the context argument and Anchor will automatically deserialize the instruction data into the arguments. So if I go back here, you can kind of see, um, where was it? Yeah, here's, here's that example here. We're passing data, unsigning to just 64-bit. It automatically gets deserialized. 
So the IDL file that I was talking about before gets generated when you build or compile a program with Solana. And um, it's actually kind of similar to an Ethereum ABI file where it's used by clients to be able to interact with deployed anchor-based programs. Uh, and it basically says, what are all the input parameters? What are all the accounts that are expected for, for each kind of function call? So um, here you can see an example this is the uh, IDL file for the program we looked at earlier. Um, you can see there's this uh, initialize instruction. Um, no, was it called initialize? It's called set data there, but for some reason here it says initialized. Uh, it's expecting these accounts and then these are the arguments that it's expecting. So this is a generated IDL file. Um, yes, Solana has a bit of a steep learning curve, but once you go through it and play around with it yourself, you'll find that it's not too bad actually. And, and Anchor definitely makes things a lot, a lot easier. So let's go through an example program now. Let's do a, a GM program, which is basically a simple Hello World program that takes a, an input parameter of a name and, and then we'll say GM to it. So, whoops, excuse me. So someone asked in the chat about a remix equivalent of Solana and um, I pasted a link in the chat to what's called the Solana Playground IDE, which came out recently and is uh, absolutely amazing in my opinion and a game changer for Solana. So this is uh, an equivalent to remix kind of um, where you've got an installed version of Solana uh, you've got an installed version of Anchor, et cetera. Um, and you can kind of do uh, your, you can kind of write your code here and deploy it to DevNet. And then um, you can interact with it with your own clients and stuff like that. So we're going to create a new project here. So um, the first thing you need to do is you need to generate a, a wallet for yourself for Solana DevNet. Now I've already done it here uh, and you can see it's already given me some soul automatically. Um, but if you go to the bottom left, you can see it says connected to Playground Wallet. Um, if you don't have this, you can just click on the link to generate a new wallet. Um, and I think, let me just open it in a new window. Yeah, so if you go not connected, um, you go continue, and then it will say connected to Playground Wallet. And if you click on the wallet here, you'll see you get airdrops from Sol. So that's kind of how you do it if you haven't created a wallet yet. So we'll go back to my screen. So we're going to create a new project. And in our case, it lets you choose. You can choose a native Rust program, um, an Anchor-based one, or a Seahorse one. We're going to go with the Anchor example. So we go, let's give it a name, GM. So cool. Next, um, one minute. No, that's not the right one. So next, what we're going to do is we're going to blow away all of the code that's in the example program, um, and we are going to put in some new code. And I'm going to go through it all. Now, in the interest of time, I'm just going to um, paste it in and uh, walk through it with everyone um, because I don't want to sit here typing for too long when we've only got limited time. So um, I'm going to share a link in the chat where I got this code from so that you guys uh, and girls can, can play along at home if you want. Um, Exercise two is where the code is from. So I, I've just pasted it in. Um, and as you can see, it's an anchor program. We've got the declare ID here. Let me make that a bit bigger for everyone. And, and then we've got our program hook here that says this is where all the program logic is. Very similar to the previous example we saw earlier. Uh, in this case, we're just, uh, we have a function called execute. Uh, the context is execute. And it's taking in a string parameter uh, called name. And the execute context that we're specifying here, um, we're defining it down here. So 
So we're saying whenever this execute context is used, we're expecting this GM account to be passed in, which is of type greeting account. And the greeting account type is defined here as just a struct with an, a string called name in it, right? Um, and these little hooks above here is actually saying this should this account that's passed in, we need to initialize it, right? Because uh, it's, it's an empty account at first. So we need to say, create a new account. Um, we The person who's paying for the rent for this account is going to be the person that's signing the transaction. And the amount of space we want to allocate for this account um, is eight bytes plus 32. I think the first eight bytes is reserved and 32 is just me picking a, a random number that's going to be big enough to store any name. So this is basically saying um, the first account that's passed in, we need to initialize it um, and, and pay some rent uh, to Solana. And then we're also passing in the user, which is the person signing the transaction. And we're passing the address of the system program as well um, in this context, because when you initialize accounts, you need to use the system program to do that. Um, so that's kind of just pretty standard Solana or Anchor stuff. Um, and yeah, that's it. Once the uh, GM account is initialized, um, we are basically uh, grabbing that account here and setting the GM account dot name value to the name that's passed in. And in the console or program output, we're saying GM to that name and that's it. So the program is taking the name input it's uh, initializing this new account that's passed in, which once again can be thought of like a file it's saying, hey, create a new file, give it this amount of space, we're going to pay the rent now. And then once that file is created with this name that's passed in, we're going to store it in that file and then just spit it out to the program output. So I'm going to press the build button on the build tab and we'll just give it a minute. So it's down the bottom, it says build successful. Uh, great question, Ayush. Uh, is it resourceful to have a deep knowledge of development in both blockchains, Solana and Ethereum, meaning there are scenarios, project, which coding in both are needed? Uh, it depends entirely on, on what your preference is. So um, Ethereum and EVM is obviously the most popular way to go right now. Um, but you have ecosystems like Solana, which definitely have um, their own kind of advantages over Ethereum. Um, it's, it's a much faster chain, it's cheaper, it's got a very big developer ecosystem. Um, if you're a Rust developer or you know Rust, then it's a lot easier for you to get onboarded into something like Solana rather than Ethereum. Um, and, and yeah, there's a lot of cool and exciting stuff that's happening on Solana as well. Um, and, and the skills are transferable to other um, blockchains that, that use Rust as well. Um, there's a few others too. So um, yeah, if you can learn both, it's great. But if you can't, then you just need to kind of pick which path you want to focus on first, I guess. Great question. So we've built our program now. What we're going to do is we're going to try to deploy it um, to DevNet. So we're going to press the deploy button and we're going to just watch the output at the bottom here. So while that's running, um, I'll talk about what we're going to do once that's done. So once that's done, we're going to create a client to interact with that um, with that uh, deployed program, and we're going to do that in uh, not in actually. Can you do it in? Yes, you can do it in um solana play, playground actually we'll try i've never done it in the solana playground here we'll try to do it in in here and if it doesn't work we'll, we'll do it in visual studio so um we're just waiting for it to be deployed to devnet there we go successfully deployed now so once it's deployed you can go in this um middle tab here build and deploy you can expand the program credentials and see here is your program id here um, and, and you can get the export the ID out if you want as well. So we have a program deployed to DevNet. How do we interact with it now? So we need to create a client to interact with it. Um, I'm going to try to create a client in Solana Playground. So um, 
new file, client.js. Cool. So from that same document that I shared, I'm going to grab the client code and I'm going to go through it with everyone. Let's make that a bit bigger. Let's see if this is going to work now. So um, the first thing is we're saying that we're using the uh, Anchor JavaScript library, um, in, in, and that's what these two lines here are. And we're setting the provider. Uh, is, this is basically just saying we want to use the, the, the DevNet environment here. And in our client, it's, it's, it's just a JavaScript uh, function, essentially, that's going to interact with our deployed program. We have this main function here. And um, mm, I'm not sure if it's going to work here, actually, because where do we have the IDL file? OK, I'm just going to try it first, because I don't think it's going to work. Yeah. It's, I don't think it's smart enough. Let's do it in Visual Studio Code. So we've deployed our program on DevNet. We we know what the um, deployed um, ID is here. We, we can literally copy it here if we want. Um, so now let's create a client. So I'm going to switch to Visual Studio Code. Um, and let's create a new folder called um, let's switch into that. Make it a bit bigger for everyone. Uh, let's initialize a new project with npm. So we're going to an npm init slash wire. And cool, we have a package.json. So the next step is we need to export some stuff from Solana Playground. So um, we need to, um, first of all, we need to export our wallet details um, because we're going to use the same wallet to interact with it. So so if you click on wallet on the top right and you click on these three dots, you can go export key pair. This will export. Um, this will export your your wallet key pair file so that you can then use it in your client. So we're going to save it here. Um, the next thing we're going to export is we're going to also export the program credentials, uh, and it's going to be called program key pair. So we know how to uh, where to connect to our program. Uh, and the final thing we're going to export is the IDL file that was generated. So we're going to. Save, a, save all of them to the same folder. So if I go back here now, you see I have an idl.json, a program keypair.json, and a wallet keypair.json. So I'm going to create one more file in here, and I'm going to call it client.js. And I'm going to paste the code that I had before. Sorry, before we do that, I'm going to replace the contents of my package.json um with the one from the doc which essentially says we're going to use the uh, anchor javascript uh, framework as well as this minimist one here for passing things on the command line um, and we're going to run npm install to install those we'll give that a minute to run Cool, so that's done. So we're going to go back to our client, paste in the code from the doc, and we'll go through it now. So here we're saying we're using Anchor. Um, we're setting Anchor to the provider, which is saying we want to use DevNet. Um, we have our main function. So this is where we're going to reach out to our deployed smart contract and uh, interact with it. So we're going to read in this IDL file that was deployed here. And um, we are going to take the program ID um, from the command line when we execute the client um, because we know what it is from Solana Playground. Uh, we're going to set a name here in, in my in my example. I've just got Harry, but you can pass in a name parameter too if you want. And here we're going to create a connection to a program using the IDL file 
and the program ID. So it's equivalent of ethers.js getting a connection to a deployed smart contract. Um, once that's done, we're going to use the anchor framework uh, library to generate a, a new key pair to be used for a new account. Because remember, we need to pass in a new account to say GM2 and to store the GM name. Um, it's going to log some output. Uh, and then, yeah, all we have to do is we go, we have to go program.rpc. Function name and the function name we had was execute, right? So execute, we're going to pass in the string parameter and then we're going to pass in an accounts array. And, and this needs to match up with what's expected here in the accounts uh, hook here. So we're passing in that new GM account that we're going to store the GM name into. We're going to pass our own uh, account and we're going to pass in the system program uh, program ID. And that's it. That will send the instruction over. It should say GM to the uh, to the name to the person. And then what we're going to do is we're just going to read the contents of that account to to verify that it actually stored the name in there. So this is what we're doing here. We're saying program .account dot greeting account. So it's looking for uh, this right um, dot fetch. Um, GM account public key. So this is that account that we passed in earlier to say, hey, for this account that we um, that we have, get the greeting account uh, name value. Right, we're just printing it out here. Dot name. So it's saying for the account that stores this data, um, grab the name that's stored and just spit it out to the console output. So that's pretty much it. Um, now there's a couple more things you need to do before you run it. So um, when you're using the Anchor JavaScript framework, there's a couple of environment variables that you need to set before you can use it. So the first one is you need to tell Anchor what the uh, RPC URL is to connect to the network. So in this case, um, DevNet is what we're connecting to. And um, there's a free RPC endpoint run by Solana called api.devnet.solana.com. So we're going to export Anchor provider URL to that. And then lastly, we need to tell them what wallet file to use to, to generate and sign these transactions. So we're going to say it should use this wallet key pair, JSON one that we grabbed from our Solana playground. So we're using this, the same wallet there in our client. So once that's done, you should be able to run the client. So to run it, you go node client.js, you pass in your program ID. And then the name parameter, if you want. So in this case, the program ID we can get from Solana Playground. So I'm going to grab it from here and paste it in the name. Cool, that's done. So you can see here's the program instructions. Um, program log, it says GM Harry. If I go back to the smart contract here, you can say, see here, it says GM and then GM account dot name. So this is where it got that from. And then as you remember in the client at the end, we actually just to double check things, we go to the account or the file as, you, as I like to call them and we grab what's in there, turn it back into a string and, and print it out just to verify that it was stored. And you can see stored GM name is Harry. And you can see here stored GM name is Harry. So, um, yeah, that, that, that was the first example of um, using Solana Playground to create a, a new anchor program and deploy it. In this case, just a simple one that takes a string and says GM to it and stores it in an account. Um, we, we deploy that to DevNet on using Solana Playground. And then once it was deployed to DevNet, we switched over to VS Code and we created a new project that used the anchor JavaScript library. And we, did, we got, um, got a connection to that deploy program and we executed the execute function on that program, passing in um, a string and as well as a new account to store that string in. So that's the first example that I've got for you guys. If you have any questions on that, feel free to ask in the chat. Otherwise, I highly recommend to try it yourself uh, later on. I'll paste the exercise doc in the chat once again. Um, otherwise, we will move on the last section, which is another example using chaining price feeds. So um, just quickly, 
Chainlink data feeds are live on Solana DevNet. Um, this is where you can get high quality pricing data for your applications on Solana, whether it's a DeFi application, whether it's anything. Um, we've got, I think, six or seven feeds live on Solana, as you can see. Um, and they're, they're quite easy to use. So if you go to docs.chain.link and go to Solana tab, um, they're all listed here. So data feed addresses, um, here are the mainnet feeds, here are the devnet feeds. Um, and then there's some guides on how to use them on chain in your smart contracts um, and off chain from your front ends, from your JavaScript libraries, et cetera. So we'll go through one example of that now. Um, but yeah, if you want to enter and try win the Solana bounty for the 10K bounty, um, you need to use these data feeds in some way in your application. Um, you can use them uh, on your front end that ends up they're making a state change somewhere in the back end. You can use them in your, in your Rust code. Uh, it doesn't matter as long as you use them in some way, um, you'll be eligible for the prize. Uh, and, and as long as you have the smart contracts deployed on Solana. So what we're going to do for this example is we are going to um, we are going to use and pull what I call the um, Solana starter kit. So if you go to our GitHub repository, I'll share this in the chat. At this chain link this, uh, GitHub repository, um, there is a link here called Solana starter kit, and I'll paste it in the chat. This is a pre-packaged uh, anchor project. Hold on a minute, I can't. There we go. Um, this is a pre-packaged uh, anchor Solana project for uh, to show developers how to use Chainlink uh, on Solana um, in, in the most easy way possible. So I'm going to copy the GitHub URL here and we will go back to our VS Code and I'm going to go git clone Solana starter kit. Cool. Let's take a look at what's in here before we do anything. So um, to use this, you, you need to install uh, Anchor and you need to install um, Solana CLI. So Solana documentation. So to install those, um, I'll share the Inst install here, yeah, CLI. So you'll need to install these as, as prerequisites. We'll share that in the chat and you need to install Anchor as well. So Anchor Framework Solana. So here's how you install Anchor too. So once you have those two installed, um, you're all set to go to, to use um, Chaining data feeds on Solana. So if we go back to my VS code, um, what other blockchains is Chaining data feeds available in? I think we're live on about 15 chains right now. So if you once again go to docs.chain.link, um, you can see there's a tab for Solana specifically. Um, but if you go to EVM chains, um, it depends what service you want to use. If you want to use data feeds, um, you can go and see all of the chains that the data feeds are live on. If you want to go, you, if you want randomness, you can go to the randomness section and go to supported networks and you can kind of see all the networks there uh, and the same with API calls and, and automation as well. But for now, we have 10 minutes left. I want to just run through the, the, the program. So when you use... Um, Chaining data feeds on Solana, you have to import uh, this um, Chainlink Solana library here in your cargo.toml dependencies. So in we, you can see we're already using Anchor in this program here, but you also import the version 1.0 Chainlink Solana library, and that enables you to use data feeds on Solana. Once you've done that in your uh, Anchor program or, or Solana program, um, you can import the library like this, use Chainlink Solana as Chainlink. And then um, all you really have to do is um, to use data feeds is call 
uh, one of three functions really in, in this chain of library. So in this case, we show all three. So um, we call the latest round data function, um, the description function, uh, and the decimals function here. So the latest round data function takes in um, two parameters. It takes in a, a chain link, a data feed program account. So this is the account of the program that, that owns the, all the data feeds. And then it takes in a specific feed address as well. So the first one is a static value that, that doesn't change. Um, if I go to Solana using data feeds on chain, uh, anchor, you can see that um, you need to import the library there. And um, just give me a minute. Yeah, so here's the, the program ID here for the, the, the data feeds program. It's static, it doesn't change. And then you just need to choose a data feed that you want. So if you want um, sole USD, uh, you pass in that as your second account here. And that will get you the latest round data for, for that round. Um, if you want the description of the feed, you can call the description function, passing in the same two things, and it will return the description such as, you know, sole USD, ETH USD, et cetera. And if you want to know how many decimals, what the precision is of the data, you can call the decimal function too, and that will return that value there. So in this example program, we're calling all three, uh, and we're literally just printing it out, uh, the, pro the current price out uh, to the screen. So um, very simple. Um, and then we have a client that very similar to our other client, um, it stores the chain link data feeds program ID. Uh, it takes in a feed parameter. What data feed do you want to query from the list here? And um, like the other example, it just calls uh, the uh, an execute function, passing in um, all the relevant details, including the, the chain link program ID of the data feeds program and, and the feed that we want to query. Um, and then it will just print the value to the screen. So let's try and, and run this now. How much time we got left? Eight minutes. So if you follow along with the, um, if you follow along with the guide in the GitHub, uh, it pretty much tells you everything you have to do. So first thing you need to do is install all of the dependencies. When will VRF be available in Solana? Um, hopefully soon. We Solana is definitely a focus for us. Uh, however, we've spent a bit of time just making sure our price feeds are, are really bulletproof and, and, and uh, as good quality as possible. Um, but I do know that there's a lot of interest in VRF and that's hopefully something that will come in the very near future. What's up, Tippy? Um, cool, okay, so that is installed. Let's see if we can create a new wallet file now. So. Solana Keygen uh, basically just lets you generate a new wallet uh, file. In this case, we're going to do an empty one. And the next step is to then airdrop ourselves some sold tokens to it. So we're going to copy that command. And it's going to run twice, actually, to get us two lots of two sold because each airdrop can only be as most two sold on DevNet here. Um, but we're going to take four because we're a bit greedy. So once that's done, we are going to try and um, build our anchor program. Cool, so we're gonna run anchor build, which is going to compile our program. And um, if you remember how we need to have the correct program ID in here, anchor's got this funny uh, thing where you need to compile it once to find out what the program ID is going to be. And then you need to take the program ID and put it back in here and then compile it again. So it's just this kind of thing that uh, you do as an in Anchor for now. I don't know if they've solved it yet or not or, or done a better workaround, but um, last time I used it, that's kind of what everyone was doing. So once it's compiled, we're going to find out the program ID using this command here. And then we're going to throw that program ID back so here's the program id we're going to put it in here in place of the old one we're going to save that and we are going to build again 
Can one use Anchor to take data from an Ethereum project to use in a Solana project? Uh, no, Anchor can't reach across uh, chains. It's just for doing stuff on Solana itself. Um, to reach across chains, you need to use a, a cross-chain protocol that can talk to both Ethereum and Solana, such as Wormhole. Um, but in the future, CCIP, Chainlink CCIP will, able to, will be able to do that. Um, cool, so that's compiled. So let us move on to deploy. So we're gonna run anchor deploy, passing the DevNet cluster in to say, hey, we, we have our compiled program, we wanna deploy it to DevNet now. Where to check on new developments updates for Chainlink. The best place to keep up to date with, with Chainlink is on our socials. I will share that in the chat. Share the Chainlink uh, Twitter account. That's definitely the best place to, to keep in touch. And if you're interested in uh, interacting with me as well, feel free to follow me as well. I'll post my Twitter as well and I'd love to, to follow everyone back. Cool, so it looks like our program was successfully just deployed. Let's interact with it now with our, uh, with our client that I showed you guys earlier. So um, once again, we need to specify these environment variables again. So we need to say, um, use this RPC endpoint here to connect to DevNet and our anchor wallet, our wallet that we're gonna use for the transactions is stored in this ID.json that we generated. Um, Cool. Once that's done, we can copy the code for the um, client. So in this case, it's dynamically grabbing our program address using this command here. And then we just say, what feed do we want to query? So which feed should we choose? Maybe we'll do sole USD. Or we'll paste this one here. Oh, something weird happened. What happened? Let me try again. Grab the command. Sorry, just give me a minute. Something weird has happened there. Okay, let's try again. Um, did I deploy it correctly? Yes, I think so. Hmm, it's saying the account is owned by a different program than expected. That's all right. I'll take a look at that. Um, let me try the off-chain client next. So um, let's try the client that just reads the price feed data from off-chain. That is the read data script here. Um, it takes in the feeds program ID and a data feed that you wish to query. Um, 
and it listens for events on on the program. So it listens for each time a, a round is updated on the price feed, and it just prints it out to to the screen. Cool. So that one works, as you can see. That must be the ETHUSD price that's being updated. So every time the round ends, in in usually after a second or two, um, you can see the the price being updated. Um, I'm not sure why this one wasn't working, but I will take a look after this live stream because we're, we're running out of time now and I'll update the description. Um, let's take a look at some of the questions. In order to build a front end, you would need the ID of the program and the IDL, right? Yes. So you need the IDL that we generated in Solana Playground or in VS Code if you do it all in VS Code. Um, and you'd need the program ID because you need to put them into your front end code to say, hey, Here's the program that I need to interact with. Here's the IDL file that says how you interact with it. Um, and then kind of that's how you do it. Um, I'll share some resources to help you out with that too, just in a minute. Uh, when will VRF be available in Solana? Uh, hopefully very soon. Like I said, we're, we're, we know that there's a need for provable randomness uh, on Solana. Um, keep up to date on the Chainlink socials to kind of find out. But let's just end things now by going where you can learn more. Um, so there's this really cool site called Solana Cookbook that has a great collection of tutorials and guides for programming with Solana. I'm going to share that in the chat with everyone. I highly recommend this one. It's really cool. Another place is SolDev. So this is kind of like an aggregated um, collection of guides and tutorials for Solana development from community contributors too. So you can even contribute uh, something to this one if you want. So um, there's a lot of cool stuff in there. Recommend checking that out too. And the official Solana developers page at solana.com forward slash developers has a bunch of amazing content as well uh, from beginners to experts, lots of guides, tutorials, and, and some great uh, handy guides there. So definitely recommend checking that out. Um, uh, for more info on Anchor, the Anchor framework, you should check out the Anchor book, which I pasted in the chat too. Uh, it's got a whole bunch of guides on using Anchor. Um, and once again, the Solana Starter Kit, which we just looked at now, which is a pre-packaged repository for using Chainlink on Solana, shows you how to do it, what libraries to import, et cetera. Um, that's a great resource too. I'm going to share one more for everyone who wants to do a deeper dive on Solana. Uh, if you go to chain.link slash bootcamp, we actually have, uh, it's an eight hour on demand Solana bootcamp that you can do at your own pace. Um, so it's it's pre-recorded. There's a, a whole bunch of exercises uh, and it runs for about yeah eight hours. So I pasted that in the chat too. If you wanna do that, you should sign up. Uh, it's a really great resource. It, it assumes no prior knowledge um, and it will get you creating, deploying and interacting with Solana smart contracts as well. So that's it. Um, where else can you get help? You should go to our Discord, uh, ask us for help if you need. If you have Solana specific questions, uh, we've got the Solana Discord here, solana.com forward slash Discord. Um, but yeah, other than that, I wanna thank everyone for participating. Um, I really hope to see some projects built on Solana, even if you think it's very simple or it's not finished or you don't think it's cool. If you build something on Solana that uses Chainlink, um, definitely submit it to the hackathon. I'm gonna be personally be looking at all of them and I'd love to see some cool ideas. Um, but yeah, other than that, thank you for listening. Uh, I hope everyone has an amazing rest of their morning, afternoon or evening. And I hope everyone has a great uh, rest of the fall 2022 Chainic Hackathon experience. Thank you all.